Welcome back to the Innovation Engine podcast. I'm your host and Three Pillars Chief Evangelist, Scott Varho, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by Josh Seiden to talk about how to drive outcomes over outputs. Josh is a designer, strategy consultant, coach, author, and speaker who has worked with a number of companies that are household names, including T. Rowe Price, J.P. Morgan Chase, Fidelity, Hearst, PayPal, and 3M. He helps companies launch new products and services and in the process create a more agile and entrepreneurial organization. In addition to his consulting work, Josh is also a prolific author. His latest work, which we'll focus on today, is Outcomes Over Outputs, Why Customer Behavior is the Key Metric for Business Success. Prior to that, he co-wrote two books with Jeff Gotthelf, Sense and Respond, and Lean UX. Sense and Respond was nominated for Thinkers 50, Distinction and Innovation, and Lean UX has become widely regarded as one of the top UX books of all time. Joshua, we are so excited to have you on the Innovation Engine. Welcome. All right. Thanks. It's great to be here, Scott. So, you know, I, and, you know, from the intro, I, I feel like we could do an episode on each book uh, that, that you've written. Uh, there's a lot there, and certainly that's relevant to what we at 3Pillar uh, do and, and think is really important. But we are going to focus today on, on outcomes over outputs. It's, it's a relatively short book, but there's a, there's a lot to unpack. You start off the book by sharing a personal story that probably feels familiar to a lot of people in our space, uh, that you worked with a team that spent a couple of years building a strop, stock trading app for a large FinServe company that never got out the door and never shipped. Um, what did you learn from that experience? I mean, the, the <laughs> lessons are endless. You know, you spend two years working on something that doesn't ship. Um, there's a lot of conclusions you can draw. Um, but I think that, you know, the reason that I started um, the outcomes uh, book with that story is, is I thought it was a, a really good example of, you know, of, of the a great illustration of the problem, which is that, you know, it look, building great software is hard. It's hard to design, build and deliver great stuff. But um, at the end of the day, big stuff building stuff isn't the goal, right? And uh, the, at the end of the day, the the goal is to deliver value to your users, your customers, and the organization that you're working for. And so two years of building something that we, th we believed would deliver value in the future was two years poorly spent, hmm. you know? And so the the, I think the my goal since then has been to figure out how do you keep that long-term vision, right? I, my, my background is in product design. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I, I want to build wonderful things and that, that may take a long time to, to create. How do you hold to that vision of delivering great stuff um, while delivering value along the way? Can you create mm -hmm. value along the way as you're getting there? And, it's a hard problem, but I think that's that's the problem that that the book is about. Which I think is a it is a really important insight um, because it, it is amazing to me even even when I've worked with really great product leaders who understood the initial need for the product, like why why is this thing even happening, lose sight of that very quickly, and it becomes much more about execution. And even even leadership will get more focused on. You know, even if the, if the product fails, it's never that the hypothesis underpinning that product was was faulty or had gaps, um, but it was an execution problem. Um, and and so I think I think this is a really important insight for our industry. And and clearly you did uh, as well, and that's why you why you wrote the book. But I I think it's important to acknowledge that product all products are hypotheses. Um, and 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 do you understand the hypothesis? And can you take in new information and maintain vision at the same time? Um, and I, and I think really, really savvy, uh, product leaders can, um, but, um, so, so kind of going, going further into this, so if outcomes are, are natural partners with, with hypotheses, um, and, and that obviously is something that really stuck out to me because I, I, that, that humility and curiosity that you need to build great products is, is just makes sense when you realize that your product is a hypothesis. So, so what does that mean? You know, that outcomes are hypotheses and why is it such a foundational concept to grasp? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think the challenge for, for us in product development is that, um, you know, it's, it's easy and natural to think in terms of solutions, you know, it's the, it's kind of the most concrete, um, 
uh, sort of sort of way of framing what we're doing. Oh, we're mm. we're going to build X. We're going to build this thing. Oh, we should build this thing. You know, it's it. You know, it's how I think. I think it's how most of us think, right? It's it's that's that's how we frame and describe what we're doing. But um, the reason that we're doing that, the reason we're going to build this thing, is to create some effect for some result for our uh, for our users. Um, did I say outcome? Um, and, and so, so then, so then the question is, it, will this thing create the outcome that we expect? And, um, we, we want to be certain, but the fact of the matter is humans are, are weird, unpredictable group of people. And, uh, uh, that's a, that's an <laughs> oxymoron. Humans are weird, right? And they're unpredictable. And, right. and, um, and so we think that this thing is going to, problem it's gonna you know we'll put it in the world and people will use it the way we anticipate um but that stuff is hard to predict uh mm. and in some cases it's impossible to predict and so the the idea that a that a product is kind of an embodied hypothesis that it is is the sort of natural conclusion there it's like we we think this is going to work but we're not sure and mm. so how can we validate our ideas as quickly as possible um and you know, there's some amount of validation that we are used to doing in product development before the product ships, right? But there's, but there's, that's not sufficient. We at some at the end of the day, at some point, we have to put some things in people's hands and uh, see what they do with it. And mm -hmm. so, you know, when you the, the the rubber meets the road when we put our products in people's hands and that's when we can start to validate our hypotheses one, one thing that struck me when uh you know i was leading product teams uh which which is most of my career before three pillar uh, at product companies i was always really surprised at how often users used even in even in internal stakeholders if i'm delivering apis let's say to other departments mm -hmm. how often they would deviate from what i thought they were going to do with those apis um, yeah and it was fascinating, and 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 I started developing this interesting metaphor for, you know, maybe we should be paving the lines in the grass. Maybe instead of putting the paths in the grass where we think people are going to walk or where we want them to walk, we should pave it where they do walk, um, and and get okay with that. Uh, we don't need to see that as deviant behavior, but start to shore up because clearly they're getting value from it. Um, but you know, in those in each of those teams, I always sat between upper leadership and the the team executing on on this vision, on these ideas, these hypotheses. I wish they were framed that way. They they never were. Um, but but how how do you speak to you know the the leadership and the way that teams are working against their goals? Often have quite a bit of of altitude difference between them. Um, yeah. And so how do you how do you bridge that gap? Because that 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 has always that has always been a struggle. I mean, I think, I think the hardest, so I, my experience working with, with the most senior leaders is that, um, they tend to really have an intuitive understanding of the idea of an outcome. Once you sort of explain mm. it to them, um, they're, you know, very practical, they're results oriented. And if they're being candid, most of the time they will tell you, look, I don't know the answer. Sometimes they dream up the answer when they're having a shower and then they get very attached to the answer, you know, mm -hmm. so that, that's, that's the type of executive I'm used to. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, those, those people, there's, there's like a second strategy for, um, what my, my business partner, Jeff calls, a uh, 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 my, uh, my co-author Jeff calls a epiphanous shower moment. Um, <laughs> and, um, but most of the time I think senior leaders really, really get like what they're trying to do is they're trying to get a result. And so what, what happens I think is that um, in the process of translating that from sort of framing the problem to execution, as you say, we lose the script. It's hard to execute and mm. some, and up and down the organization, we start making promises. It'll be done in a month. Yeah, it'll be done in, you know, and it'll be great. It'll be done in a month and it'll be great. I think I think this is how people respond to the sort of inherent uncertainty of product development. You know, we mm -hmm. were just talking a moment ago about this idea that products are hypotheses. We don't know if they're going to work. And so 
that on un that uncertainty is really really uncomfortable it's uncomfortable for everybody and so you know there's i think the right uh, my personal feeling is that the right way to handle it is for everybody in the room to be able to say we don't know but we're working as hard as we can to find the answer and have confidence in us because we're experts at finding the answers mm -hmm. right but too often the conversation is we don't admit no one in the room admits that they don't know and so we just say we're sure this is going to work it's awesome it's the greatest thing ever and it'll be ready on monday <laughs> it's, it's, right? it's brilliant um yeah. <laughs> yes <laughs> well and well and 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 it makes sense. I mean, you know, so having sat around that table and looked into the eyes of the head of sales and said, this is a hypothesis, nothing more. Um, that's not a good day. <laughs> the, the, the head of sales has a quota to hit. Um, client success has clients they're trying to delight. Um, and so they're, they're going to be like, okay, well, you don't know. Why don't you know? And what do you need to do to know uh, before you go inflict this on our customers? Um, and the answer is, eh, there's no, there's no certitude. I can increase confidence, yeah, um, but I, I can't give you certitude. No matter what, no matter how much we spend uh, doing a research, uh, right? I do and, recommend some level of research, right? But and and it's hard to combat that if the sale, if the head of sales or the or the salesperson says, well, you may be uncertain, but I'm not uncertain because I've got a deal on the table worth of worth X, and all you have to do is say yes, and we've got revenue X certain. Right. It's hard to fight that. Mm -hmm. Very much. Um, so how, so how do you? Well, I think you have to make a choice if you're going to be sales led or product led. And mm -hmm. I know that, I know that none of this is pure, but, uh, y y y you know, the, the organization has to survive and it has to be healthy, but you have to balance being sales led and, 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 uh, product led. And if you really, really want to be product led, you have to say no to deals. You just have to do it and you have to be prepared to do it. And um, I get it. That's hard to do. Like, I'm not saying, oh, yeah, it's like you've got it. <laughs> you when know. it's not our money invested, then yes, it's it's much easier. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and I absolutely 100% agree with that. And I think it's, you know, there was a, my, the last CEO that I reported to at a product company um, whenever sales would come to the table and say, we need X from, from Scott, um, from my, from my team, from my organization, um, the CEO would say, okay, great. Well, so how much additional quota are you signing up for? Because the only way I'm, I'm changing the roadmap for Scott is if you're signing up for more quota, you, you know, the quotas were set with the existing roadmap in mind. Um, so you're, 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 and I, I just thought that was, a, that was the most support I ever got in my role <laughs> ever. Um, yeah, that's amazing. It was incredible. So I, I try to encourage all CEOs to use that with their sales teams because otherwise you become, you know, hey, I need to say yes on this RFP. So can you make a, a mobile app? And it's like, what will this mobile app do? I don't care. I just need to say yes. Then just say yes on the RFP. Like, why are you bothering me? Um, <laughs> <laughs> this isn't how we build products. Uh, I don't know what to tell you. Um, so you have these three magic questions that you, you talk about in your book that help product teams shift from... Um, from focusing on on outputs um, to focusing on outcomes, would you mind sharing those with us? Sure, sure. In the book, I, I write that they're the sort of the three essential questions when we're trying to be um, when we're trying to use outcomes uh, to frame the problem. What are the what are the user and customer behaviors that create value? Mm -hmm. And and I mean that broadly: value for the user, value for the customer, value for us. What are the things people do that create value? How do we get people to do more of those? Second question, how do we get people to do more of those? And then the third question, how do we know we're right? Hmm. And it's a little bit of a kind of a, a meta question, but it goes back to that uncertainty, right? Hmm. It's, and, so, um, and, and, and so using those three questions, getting, getting your team talking about those three questions, they're very simple and they're intentionally very simple. They, they're the sort of questions that you may look at them and go, well, let's... Those are obvious, but it's, it's amazing how often we don't ask the obvious questions, right? Mm -hmm. So what are the, what are the behaviors that create value? How do we get people to do more of them? How do we know we're right? And just working through that cycle continuously, uh, I, I, I find is very, you know, simplifying and sort of powerful, uh, tool. 
Well, and one of the things that, that strikes me in those questions is, is as you mentioned, it, it pulls in uh, humility, um, and right. So it, it, it forces us sort of to, to grapple with the fact that we don't know we're right. Um, and then, and then maybe put additional hypotheses on the table in terms of how we can drive those behaviors that, that accrue value for us. Um, which is also incredibly empowering then for a team that's engaged in that endeavor. Cause that's a conversation that they can, that's actually, you know, what, you know, when you give a team, uh, uh, you know, we need to increase revenue by 30% this year across the board. That's not something that a team can really grapple with at their level. And, 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 and you do such a great job of, of separating out business impact from, from team outcomes and outputs. Um, cause I think that's really helpful for people to think of those two levels. Um, it's one of the flaws that I've seen in the OKR structure when it gets implemented a lot of times, um, you get these high level business goals translated down to teams and they're like, I don't know, I can't even connect to this. I don't know what, what you want from me, but this behavioral model that you've introduced is, is much more tractable and anyone can, can participate. I um, think have you, have you found that to be true? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think one of the, one of the big challenges in, in working, right, is, is the question that, you know, what should we be working on? You know, there's so much, there's an infinite, infinitely long list of stuff we could be doing. And so how do we know what we should be working on? And, 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 and a lot of the sort of strategic direction that we get, um, even if it's, even if it's like really insightful strategic direction is vague. And so how do we, how do we, as a, a team of people who should be working on something, how do, there's all this noise, how do we get to the like very concrete, specific, what should we be working on? Mm -hmm. And I think the, the key to the sort of framing of outcomes, um, you know, the, is that uh, if you, if you use the definition that I use in the book, which is really kind of a very very reductive definition of outcomes. An outcome is a change in behavior that creates business value. Okay. Now you, you can argue that there's other definitions of outcomes in the world, fine. But for product mm -hmm. development, just using that really simple and concrete definition of change in behavior gives teams real clarity about what to focus on. Mm -hmm. And if you can then as a team be really, really, really specific about the behavior, right? You want to tell a very specific story. This is where kind of user journey mapping comes in and mm. telling a specific story about first the user does X, then they do Y, then they do Z, you know? And and what they and and to be able to tell that that story and understand why they're doing those things and and then to be able to pick the like the key moments in that story that you know that actually make a difference. That that's a that's an I'll say that's like an analytical framework that helps us cut through the noise, right? Mm -hmm. um, and makes us focus on what's really important, which is at the end of the day, what are our, what are our users trying to do, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think it's very grounding, and it 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 it, it has a way of of sort of taking these big ideas and. Um, making them kind of sequentially more and more concrete uh, uh -huh. so that we can actually, you know, work on them. Well, and, you know, Josh, one of the things that I think is interesting about that, and, and I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on on the transition um, that has to take place for typical fe feature factory style teams, right? Like my, my, I am successful if my stakeholder is successful kind of model, which is pretty typical um, yeah. and, and found in a bunch of places. Um, but the, the head of client success, if I pick on that role alone or the head of sales, they have opinions about what should be done. And they have, you know, they certainly have a, a, a dog in that fight of what's going to be worked on and what's not going to get worked on. And it, it is interesting to think about if we're able to focus at a higher level on our, how our business relates to customer behavior, then we get out of trying to re like reduce, let's say, support ticket time. And instead, try to focus on better serving clients and not needing support. Um, you know, we can move upstream of some of these these issues, but it also requires. I mean, certainly in the gap, there's a there's a relinquishing of control. I'm not in a roadmap conversation anymore as a head of client success. I'm not able to specify the five top bugs that I want addressed necessarily. Um, 
How do you deal with that transition? How do you advise leaders going through this? Because it, it can be, it can feel like you're giving up a lot of control. Yeah. I think. So I, God, the, the, I wish I had like one answer for you, you know? but there's like, <laughs> there, there are a handful of things that, that you need to make this work. And I think one of them is, is recognizing that like this approach is really good when you don't know the answer. Right. And so like simple things in the roadmaps, like, oh, you know what? We just need to fix this bug. Hmm. We're getting 10,000 calls a week about this bug. And if we <laughs> fix this bug, we will not get those 10,000 calls. Right. Like yeah. that's, that's not a, that's not a sort of, that's not a place where there's like a, a lot of risk in that hypothesis. Right. Right. And so it's like, sometimes you just make stuff cause you're pretty certain it's going to work. Right. Um, but, but then there are other things where you don't really know. And, you, and like, maybe the conversation is such that somebody in the room is asserting that they know, but actually we don't know. And, mm -hmm. and so for me, that's a lot about the conversation in the organization and what do we do? If you ever, have you ever been in a room where you're debating aggressively, whether it should be feature A or feature B or feature C and everybody's got an opinion and they're making all these super articulate arguments. And mm -hmm. that's a room where no one knows the answer. You know, there's not enough information in the room to make a good decision. And so it may be that one of those people has enough information, but the others don't share it, right? right? And so that conversation needs to change so that there's kind of, you don't have that information asymmetry. And maybe mm -hmm. what it means is that the head of sales and the head of customer success and your product lead need to go do that discovery together. Uh -huh. Right. Uh -huh. And and try to get that, try to build that shared perspective and shared understanding so that there is enough information to start making uh, collaborative prioritization decisions instead uh -huh. of just saying, hey, my org needs X and my org, org needs Y. I had the uh, the. Um, well. I think I was, I was punished in a, for, for prior crimes and prior <laughs> lives. Uh, but I got to run identity and access management for Pearson uh, back when we had uh, Financial Times and The Economist and Penguin Books and uh, massive um, education uh, suite spanning K, K through 20 um, and post-secondary uh, post education. It was, it was an incredible array of, of stakeholders that I was managing. And they, they, went, they refused to talk to one another. They yeah. were like, no, 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 no. I, I make revenue. You need to listen to me. Um, you're a tax on my revenue. I was like, I, I, okay, but if I give it to you in the proportion of my total budget, then you get six minutes. <laughs> like, so <laughs> this is not terribly effective. We could do this hub and spoke thing all day, but I would really well uh, appreciate you joining uh, joining the, the broader conversation. Um, uh, but it was it was incredibly difficult. Uh, yeah, incredibly difficult. Yeah, and I think you know honestly, like like I I do a lot of. Um, like training in methods and process and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and there are just some problems that are not methodological problems, mm -hmm. you know, yep. right? Like there's just like there's some problems that are really like culture or organization or just like, as you say, like getting people to talk to each other, you know? Mm -hmm. And like you use any method you want. It doesn't matter. The method is not your problem. Right. That's right. That's right. Uh, I had a, a I had a stakeholder behavior issue. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Um, I would have so loved to get into a more uh, a more cogent conversation with my my executive stakeholders around what is it that we really want out of this. You know, you're spending northwards of ten million dollars a year with me and my team, which is an incredible sum of money for what I do. Um, you know, I know that I'm not allowed to go down. Don't forget that. That's very, it's very expensive for me to make sure that we don't go down. Right. Um, right? Infinite scale globally in 16 languages is not hard, is not easy. Um, but, um, but, but there, then this, the, they had this drive to innovate. And so they thought they were, they were on the hook to change their business models their access models and all that stuff. And I was like, that doesn't scale. I can't provide so much business logic that only serves, you know, Pearson higher ed Italia. Um, that's that's not gonna scale. Um, so we're gonna need to come together and have some conversations. I, I used to always tell my most opinionated stakeholders, make some friends. 
get to a critical <laughs> mass <laughs> like, so I can deliver 10 really high quality things rather than 50 low quality things. Make That'd some be great. friends. I love that. <laughs> they didn't, they didn't There's know a that book funny. for you. <laughs> <laughs> we can find a friend. Yeah. Um, so, you know, <laughs> um, roadmaps to nowhere. I love, I love that line. Um, they certainly don't sound like something that anyone would, would really want, but they are incredibly common. Um, and this probably kind of brings us back to the thing that we were talking about, but outcomes-based roadmaps, can you give some, some texture to what an outcomes-based roadmap would look like and how that's different from a, a well, roadmap to nowhere or, a, or an output-based roadmap? I know what those look like. Yeah. So, you know, I, we use roadmaps to communicate with our stakeholders where we're going. And uh, usually the agreements that we make with our stakeholders are agreements to build certain things by certain dates, right? So yep. all based on outputs and like we talked about, all based on the hypothesis that these outputs are going to create some value. And so what, um, what I think is really valuable is to bring more context into that conversation about what we're working on and why we're working on it. And so the why we're working on it is the outcome. We're building these features because we want to generate this result, right? Hmm. And so having a, a roadmap that expresses sort of, you know, if you can kind of picture a, a row along the top of your roadmap, um, maybe the title of your roadmap is your objective, right? And then the, below that are your key results, which, by the way, are outcomes, right? Hmm. And so you've sort of got this orienting thing on the top of your roadmap. This quarter, we're working on one, two, three important outcomes. To deliver those outcomes, well, here are the features that we're working on, right? Hmm. Some of them are cut and dry, right? We're fixing this. We're working on the bug list, right? Mm -hmm. um, but some of them... Oh, we're not sure, right? We're we're trying to we're trying to grow subscription rates. We're going to try this and this and this and this. There's one more piece in an outcome based roadmap, right? Um, so you've got the context why we're doing it. You've got the traditional kind of roadmap content, which is these are the things we're going to we're planning to deliver in this time period. Below it, there's a new row, which is the discovery row. Hmm. These are the questions that we're answering this quarter so that we can start to approach the start, you know, so that we can figure out how to deliver these outcomes. And so I think a, a roadmap that has those features, right? The, 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 the why at the, uh, at the top, this is why we're doing it. We're trying to create this outcome. And by the way, we'd like to be measured in terms of the outcome. Right. This is this is like the agreement we'd like to make is outcome level. Uh -huh. These are the features, so you know what's coming. That's important for the organization. Organization needs to know what features are coming, and these are the questions that and the risks that we're trying to manage as we get there. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you can have a conversation with stakeholders without talking at all three levels. If you only right. talk about what you're delivering, I, for me you're not doing your job as a product manager, as a product team, right? And so I think, uh, you know, a roadmap that reflects those three things, it starts to reflect the sort of complexity of, of the work of a product team um, mm. that I think makes for a better conversation. Well, the, one of the things too, and, and, and you can tell me if I'm on the right track, I, I salivate. I mean, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be now at Three Pillar, where we have incredible. Our UX is is really grounded in in the value of research, um, and and doing embedded research with the build process, so that we're constantly mental mapping our our users and trying to understand execution in at a really textured um, uh, level. Really understanding our users' mental model and how that relates to our product mental model, and 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 um, you know, figuring out how to how to bring those into into sync, which sort of leads me to this this idea that what if product teams could help your company be more competitive by understanding your users better than your competitors do? What if we were mining for those insights and flipping the conversation from I'm here to execute on a list of agreed features to I'm here to make us a more competitive company? 
it's a very different role for a product team to have in a company than than what they're typically tasked to do. Right. But that's, I mean, essentially what you're talking about would lead to that, where we would discover something about our users that our executives and even even our users themselves don't know about themselves. Yeah, and I think you know that's the pitch for you know product led growth, right? Is mm-hmm. that uh, you know the we we are the, I I I. I often tell the product teams that I'm working with that that your job as a team is to be the world's foremost experts in what mm-hmm. your customers are trying to do, and then the the best in the world at delivering solutions that help them do that, right? And mm-hmm. you can't do that if you're just you know dreaming up answers while you're on the bus to work, you know. Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> well, a lot of executives think that's how how innovation happens, right? So. Um, you know, which, the three, which, the, the three B's of, of scientific innovation are, are bed, bath, and bus. <laughs> That's where all the great sorry. breakthroughs happen, right? <laughs> That's great. I love that. I'm going to, I have to use that. <laughs> That's, uh, um, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, well, Josh, we, we are we are always looking to to innovate ourselves, um, and uh, we actually turned to ChatGPT to generate some some questions for our uh, our uh, episode today. Um, and we we selected the top two. Are you are you ready for some AI questions? Yeah. Can I answer them with AI? <laughs> uh, actually, that would be fascinating if you did. Um, uh, but hopefully, not. hopefully, you won't need to. Um, how can product development teams? effectively balance the need to deliver immediate results with a longer term focus on business outcomes. Yeah. So I think, you know, that, that goes back to the first question you asked me, which mm-hmm. is, you know, how do we get out of the business of building for two years, right? And delivering value continuously along the way. And so to, to me, that's about, you know, um, I think first building the, the, the muscle to do continuous discovery and continuous delivery, right? Mm-hmm. And yep. so can we, can we deliver something valuable every two weeks? Right. 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 And, and I often use, oh, sorry, God. No, 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 go ahead. I was just going to say, I often use a gold mining uh, analogy here. Um, you know, there's hopefully there, before you go digging an actual mine, there's a set of steps that you take to improve confidence that there's actually going to be gold when you dig. Um, and anyone who knows anything about gold mining knows, yes, there's a lot of steps before you dig. Right. You want to, you want to know where to put the shovel down, but you also don't want to spend spend 10, you know, two years studying where to put the shovel down. Right. That's right. And I think, I think a lot of our traditional, um, uh, market research and product research methods, um, you know, uh, we would spend, certainly when I started my career in design consulting, we would spend a lot of time doing research. And a lot of time doing design before we started building and delivering things to, to end users. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also think it's possible to throw away that whole process and just start building and delivering. I don't think either of those are the right answer. I've, mm-hmm. I think you want to you want to deliver things unreasonably early, <laughs> but you want to be doing them based on good cus- good and continuous customer insight, and you want to be using each delivery to um, to create value and to create learning, right? Yep. Um, and so even if you're working towards a long-term vision, and I, I think you should be, right? I think good teams work towards a long-term vision. Um, you're still finding ways to uh, to sort of uh, deliver uh, incremental value along the way. Yeah. Well, and, and I'll add to that. And you, you've got the learning, you've got the incremental value. And then with that comes the confidence that we're onto something that it that is valuable. Um, so right. that you're right. not or discovering you're delivering things, years. right. Or you're, de- or you're delivering things that are, that are landing like lead balloons and you're like, oh, we better pivot. Right. right. Let's not wait right. two years to pivot. We've delivered every two weeks for the last, you know, quarter, we've delivered something that hasn't worked. Yeah. You know, that's, yep. that's some evidence. We might need, yeah, we might need a new set of hypotheses because these right. aren't working out. Right. Exactly. Um, absolutely. No, I, I, I love that. Well, and it, and it's also really, I, one of the ways that I try to bring executives along on this, and I'm sure you, you've uh, said some version of this as well, is you want that increasing certitude that your money is well spent. Um, and this model affords you that. Um, it's, it's not about fidelity to your original idea. It's about 
fidelity to business results, which, you know, as you know, Marty Kagan and I kind of got into it over this, like, you know, he was kind of like, no, they're dying to let go and let teams, you know, drive. And I'm like, ah, not the executives that I've worked with. They're, they want more <laughs> control, not less. Yeah. Um, but but once they realize that they can empower a bunch of humans to really chase the same target that they have and not be so stuck on the originating idea um, that this has more value potential than slavishly forcing teams to follow an original idea, um, that that. That, that is where the, you're like, if you let go, it'll set you free. You, you have the possibility of greater innovation um, and, and finding out things you don't currently know. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's a good thing. It's a good yeah. thing for your business and your own success. Um, so ChatGPT has got another question for us here. Can you provide examples of organizations um, that have successfully made the shift to a business outcomes focused approach in their product development? And what were some of the key factors that contributed to, to that success? So uh, a couple of different like ChatGPT but did pretty well. Yeah, those are pretty good <laughs> questions. Um, so uh, I worked with a, a, a small um, nonprofit that uh, um, you, uh, a few years ago um, that did a really good job. They they, they came to the consulting company I, I was a partner in at that point, and they wanted us to build um, a two sided marketplace. Hmm. Um, and they had a big fat requirements book. And a, 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 a not correspondingly fat budget, nor a correspondingly <laughs> fat timeline. Um, they said, you know, we have to launch this marketplace in six months. And we said, look, there's a lot of stuff in this requirements document that seems risky to us. We just don't know if you need it. And so can we just talk about like when you launch in six months, right? What, what will be the results? What, what will people be doing? What's the evidence that the that we need to demonstrate? And they said, "Oh, well, we need the amount. Marketplace needs to be up and running. Okay, that's an outcome. People are doing something. Mm -hmm. Marketplace needs to be up and running. We need to have this many companies registered on this side. We have need this many people registered on that side. That's an outcome, right? People have registered mm -hmm. for the marketplace, and we need to have this many completed transactions in the marketplace. It's an outcome." So we said, okay, if we could do that without building any software, would that be acceptable to you? And they said, no, we're paying you to build software. <laughs> we need this to operate. And we said, okay, if we could do this with building less software, is that acceptable to you? And they said, well, yeah. Okay, right? So now we're getting somewhere. And so we launched the marketplace. We, 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 we focused on, um, we operated, the, the, we had, I think, a 20 week timeline, something like that. Don't quote me on that. But, um, you know, we, we started operating the marketplace manually um, with before we had any front end. And we, we started with simple static web uh, front end web uh, pages to uh, see so that people could see what was going on that we manually updated each time there was a transaction. And then mm -hmm. once we started to understand the dynamics of the marketplace, we uh, we were able to then start start to build uh, uh, dynamic front pages and and back end that supported it. And we launched, you know, we launched the marketplace. They wanted it launched in 20 weeks. We had it launched in three weeks, but it was operating manually. And then we had mm -hmm. something that was appropriate at their 20 week deadline. So that's an example of a of a, uh, you know, a greenfield project. Mm -hmm. I will say that in existing organizations, the sort of two keys to unlock it are have data. You need to be able to understand what your customers are doing, right? If you want to change their behavior, you have to be able to observe, measure uh, their behavior. So you have to have systems that let you see what your customers, customers are doing. And then you have to have a culture in place that, you know, or you need to start working on creating a, cul a culture that does what you've just been talking about, which is sort of uh, changes the way um, leaders have control. Is there, I don't really think they're giving up control as much as they're changing what that changing the control point from hmm. you know you're going to make this thing to I'm going to hold you accountable for this outcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Although, what do you do if the? I mean, oftentimes I, I deal with very ambitious leaders, um, and if their if their goals are sort of out of whack with reality, um, that, that is that achievable? Um, how do you have that conversation? 
Well, we don't, you know, that's another thing where we don't know. It's like, okay, we don't actually know if this, if this outcome is possible, but we're going to sign up to discover what's possible. Right. Hmm. And usually along the way, it's like, we're going to grow this number by 75%. Okay. Well, this month we grew it by 10%. Should we keep going? Yeah, that's good. Keep going. Right. At some point you're going to hit a ceiling and you're going to go to this leader and you're going to say, look what all the great stuff we've done. We couldn't get to 75%. But look, we've been every every week we sit down and we show you the numbers and the experiments and we're managing this conversation together. Mm-hmm. Right. And mm-hmm. so I like I, I, to me, that's the way to go. Right. Which is you don't you don't put your neck on the line and say, you know, 500 percent or you can kill me. <laughs> but <laughs> right. but you, you say like, OK, like 500 percent. Let's let's try. Let's, you know, let's see what we can do. Let's chip away at it. Let's see see where we can get to. Yeah, yeah. I think. I mean, there's there's. I mean, there's so much human psychology, right? In in this, right? Whether we're talking about the the teams, whether we're talking about the stakeholders, whether we're talking about the customers, there's a lot of of hopes and dreams, and then the and of course, then the, there's the magic wand of technology in between, um, not knowing what all uh, technology can do. Um, yeah. But it it is so interesting to root to really ground this not in the technology but in the humans. And and that's one of the one of the really wonderful things that I took away from your book, Josh. Was was you got to come back to the humans. It's always about the humans. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and I think and, that's the that's the for me that's the power. I, I I'm glad you said that because for me that's the power of of the of the question is what do people do right? Go that first magic question. What do people do that creates value? Like let's just mm-hmm. focus on that, and then let's try and get them to do more of that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. This is fantastic. I mean, I, you know, I'm already a, a huge fan of your of your book. Um, mm, thank you, and and definitely recommend to our listeners that they they check it out. Um, it's it's uh, the the case study on HBR was also really enlightening. Um, hearing about some of the some of the the emotional challenges that leaders had going through this process and letting go of that feature roadmap and and some of those things because yeah, I, I can't imagine um, my stakeholders, uh, in, in past lives being okay with, no, I'm not telling you what feature you're getting on what day. That's, that's not how this works. Um, we're going to, we're going to chase after a problem that we both think is worth chasing. Right. Um, and, right. uh, and how that yeah. plays out. What, and so much of discover. this, so much of this is about trust, you know? So, yeah. Oh my gosh. That's, that is the currency of our realm as I like to tell people <laughs> here. Um, well, fantastic. So we're, uh, um, we're, our time's almost up, but I'd love to subject you to a speed round uh, okay. of, of, of questions uh, if, you're, if you're game. Sure. All right. On your website, you write that you like to take photos in your spare time, um, and, and you have some, some great photos up there. Um, if you were going to shoot on the streets of Brooklyn, what kind of camera and lens are you bringing? Yeah. Or are you just going to bring your phone? No, I, I, have, a, I have a Sony. Uh, I have an A6500. Um, Ooh, most of the nice time, DLR. Oh, you're, you're showing it to us. It's, yeah. Most of it's the got time, quite a lens on it. <laughs> it's, got, it's got this really nice, uh, uh, 16 to 55, 2.8, uh, wide angle zoom lens on it. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's my well, well, Brooklyn, Brooklyn's changed, but you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be worried about having the, the phone taken for, or the, the, I'm sorry, the camera taken from you or anything like that. I, listen, I grew up in I grew up in New York City, and I, ah. my my first <laughs> my first skateboard wrestled from me when I was 12 years old on the six train at uh, 96th Street. So wow. I'm I'm used to that, and uh, I have uh, I don't know. I'm and not immune ra- to rather it, than, but I, I have instincts. <laughs> let's say rather, rather than being uh, being afraid of it or or uh, or what have you, you're you're like that. Nah, I'm emboldened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So you know, wh- one of the questions that that uh, we always love to ask our our guests is uh, recommended reading. Um, uh, you know, besides the obviously the text that you've written, what are some things that have been tra- transformative or impactful to you uh, in this space? Um. All right, I'll, I'll give you one business book and one non-business book, okay? Uh, so uh, business book, I, I would say um, uh, Good Strategy, Bad Strategy, uh, The huh. Difference and Why It Matters. Um, that is by uh, Richard Rumalt. Um, okay. And I just think it's it's just such a good book on strategy. I think it, it just, um, uh, for me, it sort of... Uh, blew away the fog around the topic and, and, um, kind of helped me rethink 
uh, what it is, uh, hmm. what it means when people say the word strategy. Um, so I just think it's a, it's a great book. Um, that's that's a really important topic. Yeah, that's I'll have to check that out. Okay, um, and then um, non business book. Uh, I would say let's today let's let's do writing down the bones by mm -hmm. Natalie Goldberg. Um, writing down the bones is a, is a, um, a book about the writing process. And, um, she talks okay. about in that book, she talks about the, the, the power of the sort of writing and writing and writing and writing and writing and not editing while you write just, just, you know, um, and for me there, there's something very analogous, uh, or useful for the product development process, which is that you're not going to get it right mm. the first time. And you shouldn't try to get it right the first time that you have to, you just have to make things and you can make, you make them and then you evaluate them later. And I think that's a really powerful lesson for anybody who's trying to do something creative. And, um, I think product teams are trying to do something creative. And, um, so I, I got a lot of personal inspiration from writing down the bones. I, I read that book first in, in college and I come back to it huh. when I'm feeling stuck. And um, uh, I think it's good for anybody who's working on creative things. Well, and, and I know we're in a speed round, so I shouldn't do this, but I, I do have to call <laughs> out the the product teams as a creative endeavor, or as, as that they're I, that is something. I mean, the number of people that focus on product teams as velocity, you know, productivity metrics, and they really look at it as a manufacturing, a quality and manufacturing process rather than a creative process. Um, but obviously our entire conversation suggests otherwise. Yeah, uh, no, I think it's is, a studio process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love that. Um, so w when, is, do you, when is your next book coming out? Are you working on, on another one? Yeah, so, so with, uh, with my co-author and business partner and friend, Jeff Gottelf, uh, we are working on a book about OKRs. And oh, uh, nice. if, if, um, if fortune smiles... Uh, it will be out uh, this year. Excellent. Um, it's you know you know that uh, I'm sure that that Marty Kagan is a big a big uh, proponent of OKRs, um, and I've been subjected to OKRs done poorly. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm excited to read what you what you uh, put out because uh, it is it is really difficult I think for for executives in in in, a, in, a, in the wrong mindset to grapple with what it means to to do OKRs well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to that. That's fantastic. Yeah. Excellent. Well, Josh, I am so grateful for you to come on to our, our podcast. Like I said, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of your work already and have been using it uh, in conversations with clients, uh, here at three pillar. Um, sorry about the intellectual property infringement. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I do give credit where I can. Um, but, uh, but you've been, you've been really influential for me and for, for the folks here. So thank you so much. We really appreciate having you on and talking to us. Well, it's very kind of you. It's great to be here and, and I really enjoyed it. So thanks for having me on.